I am Victor Hugh, a data scientist at Next Big Sound. I'm going to talk to you about data and the music industry and how we're both changing with and changing the music industry. So I want you to think back to 1991 when you were listening to music. You were probably listening to it on the radio a couple of times. You hear a, a brand new song. You would drive to the record store. You could purchase that album or you would wait until your favorite band came to town and you could listen to them in concert. Now, who was the, the top artist in 1991? Uh, Brian Adams, if you remember him, and Nirvana, Madonna. Any Madonna fans in the house? Yeah, all right, we're gonna have a meeting afterwards. <laughs> so the, the model of music consumption back in 1991 was very simple, right? You only had a couple different ways that you could really interact with music. So fast forward to today, the options are greatly multiplied, right? You can purchase a song or an album on iTunes. You can listen to music streaming on Spotify or audio. Uh, you could watch music videos on YouTube. So your choices are greatly magnified. And for as long as music has been around, people have focused on measuring what kind of consumption is going on. So Billboard, on the left, you'll see the very first Billboard magazine cover in 1896. It predates even recorded music because they were measuring um, sheet music at the time. And on the right, you'll see a popularity chart from 1940. And if you notice, it's recording records most popular on music machines, also known as jukeboxes. So this has evolved over time as the number of sources has uh, increased. And this is what Next Big Sound does. We monitor streaming, social, sales sources on uh, a number of different platforms. And it's not just music consumption that we track. It's also the interaction between fans and music. So going on a website, going on fan sites, viewing these pages, commenting, sharing music with your friends, and learning about music in different ways. And the amount of data that we have is, is pretty staggering. So last year, we did a sort of state of the online music activity report. And in 2011, uh, we saw over 60 billion plays of songs online and over 3 billion new fans on various uh, websites and over 16 billion views of various pages on websites. So to handle all of this data, we have uh, a number of different infrastructure items. Um, and probably five to 10 years ago, this, this company wouldn't have even been possible just due to the difficulties of sort of storing um, large amounts of data. You can take a look at some of our um, technology. And what does this all turn into? So this is a view of our, our product. You can see kind of a dashboard for each artist. So imagine if you were a fan of Adele or if you are um, a music executive at Columbia Records and you want to take a look at how is Adele trending on Facebook, on Wikipedia? What's her demographic of fans? What kind of uh, tweets or events are being talked about about her? And you can, all, you can look at all that at one page. Um, so before we came along, record executives would literally go from page to page and write down how many new fans that Adele is accumulating each day and record it in a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet and just email it around as a way to track their artists. So you can imagine how an interface like this will really sort of cut down on the amount of time necessary to monitor the artists um, and also focus more on sort of figuring out what the more interesting trends are with your artists. So as a sort of sign of how far we've come, uh, Billboard has licensed only two charts in its 118 year history. Um, Nielsen back in 1991 and us in uh, 2010. So you can see two of the charts that we power for Billboard. The next big sound, uh, fast ex accelerating artists and also the social 50, just the top 50 artists on social media. And that's produced, for us, uh, produced by us every week, uh, both online and in print for Billboard. So how do we make sense out of all this data, right? We have all this data and there's almost too much of it. If you are someone interested in, in learning about your artists or you're interested in learning about music, you really need to get a sense of which metrics really matter, right? Which networks are the most impactful? 
on what you care about your bottom line or your sales numbers. And that's sort of the, the question that I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about today. So what exactly is the impact of social media on sales, right? Is there, is there a tangible impact and which networks really matter the most? So a, a very simple way we can measure this is just looking at uh, correlation. So John Miles White had a great post defending correlations, and I think it uh, has a lot of merit. There's a lot of interesting things you can see just from correlations between social and sales data. So this chart right here is designed to uh, not only test your eyesight, but to <laughs> give you an idea of what the different cross correlations are between all, a large number of our social media metrics and sales. So on, on the top left, I've circled uh, albums, digital album sales and digital track sales. And don't worry, I'm going to zoom in to really highlight some of the features here. But uh, I, I will point out that the, the numbers on the bottom left are the correlations. Numbers on, the images on the top right are sort of a, a shading reflecting how strong the correlation is. Right? So the, the deeper the color, the stronger the correlation. So one, one thing interesting that you note is that the correlation between different uh, types of sales are, isn't as strong as you would expect. So looking at the correlation between album sales and track units on iTunes, not as high as you would expect. Um, whereas with most sources, say like YouTube fans and plays, or fans and comments on YouTube, those correlations are very strong. But within different sort of sales quantities, the correlation isn't as strong, which leads us to sort of suspect that maybe we should treat these entities as separate um, sort of quantities that have different behavior behind who buys album sales and who buys tracks. So as we jump into looking at what the highest correlating uh, social media metrics are with digital album sales, you can see Wikipedia, MySpace, RDO, Radio Pop Out. I know some of you are surprised to see that MySpace is still in existence. And I was also surprised by that. But it, it reflects the fact that we have over three years of uh, historical data. And so MySpace was very prominent three years ago. Um, and you'll see later on that MySpace, uh, their importance sort of diminishes over time. But the, the traditional model followed by uh, sort of music executives is that radio spins is highly correlated with sales. And again, we see this is true. But perhaps the most unexpected uh, feature is that Wikipedia is very highly correlated with album sales. So that's uh, maybe something that you wouldn't expect, certainly something that a lot of the music executives did not expect. Um, and it led one of our, one of our clients to uh, register their marketing team as certified Wikipedia editors so they could edit their, their band's Wikipedia pages. So as we look at digital track sales, you can see a little bit of a different picture. Uh, radio spins here are much more important, which makes sense in terms of individual tracks. And again, you see YouTube pop up as uh, sort of really, really being tied to individual track sales, which also makes sense. But Facebook and Twitter fans and YouTube fans also are popping up as um, highly correlated factors. So all this is very interesting, but perhaps we, we want to get at more of a notion of causality or what, what might be causing uh, actual sales, or in the sense that one thing we're interested in is, is more of like a forecasting causality. So the, the general task causality is very difficult if you're dealing with non-experimental data. Um, so we're focusing on the aspect tied specifically to providing information to improve your forecast. Right? So this is the notion of Granger causality, invented by uh, Clive Granger, an economist, uh, who won a Nobel Prize for this. And it really focuses on the ability of a, a process to give you information to predict other processes. So this is commonly used in uh, econometrics. You can see a chart of debt ratios for different EU countries. On the right is uh, fMRI data. So it's also very commonly used more recently in neuroscience. So not to get too deeply into the math of it all, but we're the, the focus of it really is to, to highlight and measure the effect of sort of past values of a particular variable, let's say um, YouTube video plays. Does that help you improve your future forecasts of, say, track sales? 
over just using past values of track sales. And if that's true, then we say that YouTube video views, Granger causes uh, track sales. So you can test this through a wall statistic and um, kind of speed through this. So a lot of times you'll, you'll want to test multiple variables. So here we can see the uh, album sales are in purple for a particular artist, and those are various social media metrics, and we might want to see you know, what, what is causing what. We can do that with a vector autoregression. Um, there are a couple of assumptions you got to make sure you satisfy, stationarity, and there are ways to sort of handle non-stationary processes and so forth. So, all right, what does this all lead to? So we did a, essentially a causality um, study on all the artists in our system. So there are thousands of artists in this study, and each artist who has over 100 days of sales data and also one of these particular metrics. For each artist that has this metric, we saw, we measured what is the, per, uh, how many of those artists are exhibiting this sort of significant causality. And it gives us an idea of which of these social media metrics are significant indicators for future sales, right? So here we're looking at album sales. So you can see the, the top couple metrics, Google Analytics and Psycatalyst are focusing on uh, sort of the artist's website. So all these metrics track visits to an artist's own particular website. And somewhat, not surprisingly, but interestingly, those come out to be the most significant indicators. Um, going down a little bit more, you can see the importance of Facebook, Facebook page views and visitors. Um, also, radio spins pops up as important. And Wikipedia, once again, showing up. So we can see a lot of the, the page view type style metrics are popping up as being uh, significant indicators. And a little bit lower, we see these video view metrics. Uh, Vivo is uh, the music industry's version of YouTube. Interestingly, you can see MySpace profile views are much less important. Looking at digital track sales, do we see a different picture? Well, yes, yes and no. Uh, at the top, you still see the artist individual web page uh, metrics being the most significant. But also, Radio Spins has taken a big jump up. And once again, you can see the sort of power of radio on predicting sort of your, your future track sales. And again, uh, page views popping up as face Facebook and Wikipedia both being important. But also, your video views have jumped up as well as being more important indicators. So what, what, does, this all, what does this all mean, right? What, what can we use with all this, this information? Well, it, it can help us really determine what is going on with a particular artist, what is driving their popularity, and what might be uh, good marketing plans for them going forward. So this is a, a case study that one of our uh, clients asked us to put together. And so they're interested in, in sort of the, what's driving the popularity of this artist, right? I can't really talk about who exactly this artist is, but it, he's an up and coming artist who is sort of due to top the billboard charts later this year. So definitely a, a, uh, a hot name. But we'll, we'll call this, this artist Mr. Mr. E, okay? So Mr. E, is someone who doesn't actually follow the traditional model of radio airplay driving sales. So here's a chart of different uh, singles released for a typical artist, right? You'll see in blue, green, and orange, those are uh, the radio airplays, and they all follow a very um, set pattern, right? As one single is played, then another, then another, uh, without much overlap. And you can see purple, yellow, and red, those are spikes with uh, corresponding sales being driven by these radio airplays. So for this particular artist, Mr. E, he doesn't exactly follow this pattern. So I've highlighted his, his numbers in blue. You can see his track sales are very high compared to similar artists, but his radio spins are the lowest among that pool of artists. So kind of an unusual case, um, something that breaks out of the, the traditional mold of what breaks a, a popular artist. So what's going on here? Well, uh, right around March 19th is when his popularity starts to become more consistent, and that coincidentally is when he releases his second single. So we can see here, this is a chart of uh, track sales on the left, digital track sales um, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is radio spins. And you can see um, in the red are his numbers, uh, daily numbers, 
after March 19th, black artist numbers before March, March 19th, and I've included a couple of other comparable artists. You can see generally what the ratio between those two numbers usually is, and you can see how he really jumps out um, after the release of his second single. So really, this is a, a tale about what's going on with this second single, right? The, the pattern that he follows with his first single is still consistent. There's still that arc that you see with increased radio play and then increased track sales. But then with the green and red uh, patterns, you can see that there's a sustained growth. And actually, the green is your track sales. Red is the radio airplay. So the radio airplay almost seems to lag behind the increase in, in sales. So what, what's going on here? Well, if we look at all the other social media metrics that could be driving this, well, look at YouTube. And we can see that there's a significant sort of difference in terms of how many views he's getting on YouTube relative to comparable artists. So um, the, the date of when that, that increase starts to occur is coincidentally right around the middle of March, which is when his second music video was released on YouTube. So all these things start to make a little bit more, more sense once you get a more comp comprehensive picture with uh, both marrying both social media and your sales data. So there, there's a little bit more to the story. Uh, Mr. E has a very unique fan base, very spe specifically a young female demographic, um, which perhaps can explain why he's more popular with uh, sort of the non-radio listening crowd. And maybe young women are more sort of digitally savvy and purchase music through channels not necessarily exposed to the radio. And also, you can see uh, on the bottom, this is, reflects various responses in uh, Wikipedia views corresponding to different events. So in, on the right, you can see his chart in blue. This is after an awards show uh, where he performed. You can see how big his spike is compared to other artists that perform. So you can see he definitely has a very strong digital presence. So that's just one of the the questions that we've, we've tried to answer with this data is looking at the impact of social media on sales. But we're also interested in questions like, how can we forecast you know, first week album sales with this social media data? How can we measure the, the reactions to events? Uh, how can we develop benchmarks for measuring whether someone is doing well or poorly? And sort of how do we find the next big sound before, before it breaks? Right? Those are some of the, the questions that we're interested in answering. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, music, tech, data, uh, make sure to check out our blog. Uh, it's run by our data journalist, Lee Bully. And we're always hiring. So thanks.